thanks for, for joining us this evening. Uh, I'd like to start the meeting out with a moment of silence. Uh, we lost uh, John McAuliffe, who was our town administrator, uh, ending his term in uh, 2015. And um, I think he would have been very proud at the number of people, employees, um, administration that um, said their final farewells to him on the uh, last week for his wake and then for his funeral. So. Uh, John did a lot for our town, um, and we miss him terribly, and, and certainly our condolences continue to go out to his family, so I'll ask for a moment of silence. Thank you. Uh, first item on the agenda, the approval of the regular session meeting minutes. August 3rd, 2020 minutes were distributed in advance. Any questions, comments, changes? I make a motion to approve the minutes of the August 3rd, 2020. Second. Do we have a motion and a second? Any further discussion? Courtney, would you call the board, please? Yes. 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 Next, we have the minutes of the meeting of August 6th. Any questions? Comments or concerns? Make a motion to approve the minutes of August 6th, 2020. I second. A motion is second. Any further discussion? Courtney, would you pull the board, please? Yes. Yes. I'm just going to pause. We have one other person looking to get in. Okay. So, the next item on the agenda is a joint meeting with the Conservation Commission. And let's just make sure that we can hear everybody. So, uh, Joey, let's start with you. You can hear us. Um, I can hear you a little bit. Kind of, it's kind of soft. Okay, we'll have to make sure we'll, we'll try to speak up hopefully me, that's better let me get a headset and see if it's better for my computer one second put the speaker on the chair next to where the room is yeah we're trying to we move the whole thing forward too Yeah, I'm just trying to look across. Mary, can you hear us okay? Yeah, I can hear you pretty good. Okay, I think I see Michelle next. Yes, I can hear you. Okay, thank you. I put my glasses on. Robin? Yes. All right, I think that's Fred. Yep. Okay, Tom, we can hear, and Dan? Yes. Okay, great. Uh, Dan? Yeah, I think it's still muted. Dan, you're on mute. As luck would okay. have yeah, I can hear you okay. Okay, great. Thank you. We can hear you too. Modern technology, I'm sure you've all gone through it many times. Yeah. So thanks again for, for getting together. I think the last time we were together was uh, I think sometime in December or so. Um, so this evening we put um, three specific items on the agenda just so that we could have a, a board of selectmen to Conservation Commission conversation. Um, so it's not a public hearing. There's actually no one here. Uh, this evening from the public, and it wouldn't be, we wouldn't be taking questions from the public anyway. So um, the first item was to talk about guidelines for wetland activities. This is something that uh, Joey and I had talked about. Uh, the second item would be chapter 91 dock permitting procedures. Um, we put that on here because there's been a lot of questions asked of residents around the lake. So I think, you know, um, I'll ask Joey to just kind of go through what the procedures are. It is a requirement. And, um, uh, and then the, the last item, and probably the one that might take the most time, is the proposed wetland bylaw, at least as it exists today. So that'll be the, uh, the topics. And uh, why don't we start off with guidelines, guidelines for the wetlands activities. Um, and as I mentioned, Joey and I had talked about this a little bit, that um, I think we both think it's a good idea to try to create a list. I know I've spent a lot of time, as I'm sure the Conservation Commission has spent a lot more time, 
uh, reading through 310, CMR 310 um, and all of its various sections. And embedded in there are, are things that require um, notice and dealing with the Conservation Commission. Other things kind of buried in there are things that would not require um, notice to or discussion with Conservation Commission. So the topic really was, can we create a list um, for our residents to get an idea of what you know, is required, what's not required in going to the Conservation Commission? Um, in other words, I, I, I use the example of a tree limb, which is right now on my house, uh, part of the roof of the house, and it's two and a half stories high. Is that something that I should contact Mary about um, and have her come down? And Joey, why don't you go ahead and, and answer that one, because I think it's one we talked about. Yeah, I mean, something like, um, you know, a tree limb, um, you... <sighs> It really depends upon whether you are planning on having the tree trimmed or are you looking to all out remove the tree. Um, if you are really looking to all out remove the tree, um, you really need to partner with us. It's not a bad idea to let us know what's going on regardless because if there is machinery there or um, folks are seen uh, cutting trees that that is a jurisdictional um in a jurisdictional area which is anywhere a hundred feet from a wetland um you know a neighbor will call or one of the commissioners may question what's going on so um it's never a bad idea to contact the commission but something small like a, a limb you're cutting the limb because you know these storms that are coming through that that in itself is okay. Um, but if you're looking to do more work than that, you need to partner with the commission. Yeah, so I think, I think the idea here was just, could, is it possible to have Conservation Commission just come up with um, kind of a help list for residents um, just to get an idea of when they should and shouldn't contact? And I think certainly when in doubt, you should make a phone call. Absolutely. Um, so what I'd like to do is, I don't know if any of the other selectmen, uh, Tom Claybert on the phone or Anyone here have any questions on that particular item of the three items? Randy, can I make a, a comment there? Um, and this is something that Rich Franus was a guideline that he had told me to use. And he had said, you know, if it's four inches in diameter or greater, if that limb would be four inches or greater, then you need to come to the commission. Um, so there was kind of a, a number. That was something that the that this board came up with though, it's not in the regs. It was kind of a guideline for people to use. But what Randy is saying is not just a limb or a tree, just the whole list of guidelines the town can look at that simply put, understandable, it would save everybody's time. And it sounds like a fabulous idea. I think you just used that example as a tree trim, but there's several other things that one would look at, you know, and that's something that I pushed as well. When you're going to build, come to us first so that you don't have all these plans that have to be extinct. But that would be a great list. But I, I think you just used that single example, right, Randy? That's, that's correct. I, I think if we can come up with five or six and then have an omnibus statement in there, you know, it's kind of like dig safe. You know, if you're going to put a shovel to the ground, you should be calling dig safe. So if you're going to be doing some work and you're within a hundred foot buffer, um, look at these guidelines, have them, you know, clearly posted on the Conservation Commission web, you know, front web page. And I think that will help with, with Mary's uh, number. That, that was all I was suggesting. Yeah. And I mean, the other thing too, you know, I mentioned to, you know, uh, Chairman Becker uh, in an earlier discussion that I had mentioned it at our last meeting last Monday that we were looking to sort of uh, begin to refresh our, uh, our page uh, on the website and start to put some information on there. Um, and, you know, it's, it's really good that the guidelines came up. And, you know, of course, with, with my professional job, I have a lot of, um, you know, I have a lot of connections in a lot of communities. And I can ask around to a couple of the um, really good, uh, uh, really thorough, I guess you could say, and sort of um, nitpicky um, conservation commissions or their staff. 
um, they probably have some guidelines on their websites or something that they could share with us. Um, and it's helpful. Um, there is a pamphlet um, that uh, I, I put together um, and uh, you know, some of the other commissioners proofread and that, that is on our website as well. If you're looking to do A, B, and C, contact us. This is what a wetland is. This is why you're, you know, why the commission is doing this. So, you know, I, I invite people to um, continually check our website if there's any question ever. And I, and I think um, even looking at half a dozen or so of the surrounding towns at their websites, you might get some ideas there as well. So, absolutely. Any other, any other comments from the board of selectmen members? I, I just wonder uh, how how many items do you, you think are confused at times? Like you mentioned the tree limbs. What are some other examples of, of the common type uh, questions where people don't know? If, they're okay to do it or not okay to do it without contacting you. Putting your grass clippings and your leaves in a wetland, that tends to be one of the, across the state, that tends to be one of the biggest um, uh, violations. Um, and, you know, we wouldn't, I mean, we would never come down hard on someone for something like that. You know, that would end up being just a discussion um, with the resident that, hey, did you know that you've got a wetland, you fall in a wetland area and you really can't be putting grass clippings um, or uh, debris in that area because it could be carrying contaminants. Um, you know, we don't know if you're using fertilizers, uh, invasives, things of that nature. That's why um, stuff like that, um, it, you know, that, that can't you really can't do that. It's considered dumping in a wetland. I remember throwing out as a suggestion that, uh, you know, maybe you could have a topic trees, a topic uh, ground cover, uh, bushes and grasses, a uh, topic, you know, whatever. Um, and, and maybe, you know, do's and don'ts perhaps under those topics. Right. Trees, bushes or whatever. Uh, it might be just a suggestion. Absolutely. We'll work, on a, work on a retaining wall. I mean, oftentimes people will try to do something with a retaining wall. Some people might try to dig one out and do a lot of work on it. Someone might be putting a, bro a rock back in. So another thing that I've seen sometimes is storm comes by and now you get a tree limb that's down in the water in front of your house. Do you call conservation commission or do you just go get your chainsaw and pull it out of the water and clean up your property. That's, that's a really good point, Andrew, um, because um, a lot of folks don't actually realize that after a storm that has caused, uh, you know, damage, um, particularly, you know, there's a lot of old pines and oaks that are on the lake. Um, we have, a, um, the state has what they call an emergency certification process. So basically, you, um, you know, if you're able to get in touch with us immediately and let us know, hey, I'm at, you know, I'm on, um, you know, uh, Kilder Island, I, I just had a tree come down, um, you know, I'm looking to do an emergency cert or have someone come out, I had to take the tree down. And then we could, we basically, it streams, streamlines the process for folks. Okay. Joey, couldn't we, they, all these are, should be in it, like if we, so we could, I don't know who's, who's there, the secretary, these are all great things, simple, simple things. Could we have a date that you would like this list ready for? It, uh, is that possible? So it's not, the, the, the selectmen are being very uh, uh, specific of what they want, simple thing, or make it easy for people, but uh, could there be a date that we have this revised list of and we can a guideline to call to when to call and when not? Yeah, we can we can put that together. Um, and you know, I would like the the team together, whether it's an, a small another small working group of opposite um, folks that are, have been working that are working on the bylaw. Um, so that might be a small little project for them to kind of gather and organize. 
and coordinate with Mary and, and Kelly to get that stuff um, on, the, uh, on the website. Randy, when do you think a comfortable date, so it's not pressure for us and at the same time reasonable for your request, when do you think that would be? Um, thanks, Robin. I, I had no date in mind. It was just a, just a suggestion. So that you to me, I feel like, yeah, but again, you're asking something that's very, it's really easy and it would, I think it helped a lot of people. And again, make the Conservation Commission more approachable, uh, more uh, and easy to understand. So I think, you know, is October, early November? I mean, I, I just, I don't, again, this, this COVID, yes. so my life has been upside down with my business and different things. So is that a comfortable October? Is that okay with you? I mean, I leave it, I leave it to, to Joey and, and yeah. know, the chair to sort of, I don't know, Chair Michelle, if you're the vice chair, I'll, I'll leave it to chair and vice chair. Yeah, I would point out that we could just take one topic like trees and sit there and lay it up, lay it all yeah. out and then go on to the next topic. If you're doing an NOI, here are the things that are expected and just keep expanding the list as we go. We don't need a finished document on day one. We just need a step. I think that's a great idea. Um, one of the things uh, I would be concerned about too also is um, uh, protection of the hemlocks and what, what you can do and what you can't do to protect the hemlocks from the woolly adelgid. Uh, that's actually interesting, uh, Tom, because I had this conversation with a resident um, not too long ago, he didn't actually realize that he had sick hemlocks and he was uh, in a cove. Um, the, uh, I can't remember the name of the street, but it's down near I, uh, June Street or Eileen Street. Um, and he had a whole line of sick hemlocks. Um, and I told him, I said, you know, you best, he was looking to remove two trees. And I said, you're going to have to, you're going to have to actually take these down. I said, I don't usually advocate for taking trees down, but um, if you look into the cove here, I said, there's a lot of healthy hemlocks. So if you take yours down and properly dispose of them, then you, you know, it helps to save the others from getting the woolly adelgid, um, which is another thing. You know, I mean, there's a lot of invasives, whether they be pests or, um, you know, uh, whether they're, um, you know, vegetation. Um, you know, that's out there and it's killing a lot of our trees. A lot of the oaks are, are dead from uh, the caterpillars from two years ago um, and climate change. Um, and then there's the woolly adelgid. There's, there, there's a lot of species out there. Um, and, you know, knowledge of what, when a tree looks a little sick, you know, partner with somebody. Thank you, Tom. Uh, Joey, you just mentioned too, we'll have our records reflect that um, you called your meeting to order and then before we end, we'll make sure that um, you guys close out your meeting too, because you do have a quorum. Abs absolutely, yes. Joey, be before we leave this topic, yeah. um, I think that guideline is an excellent idea, Yeah. but it should be clear that every applicant that comes before us is a different situation, it's a different circumstance. And there's no guideline that we could create that's going to cover every possible question that people have. And we don't want to give people the impression that if it's not on a guideline, they don't have to contact us. They Absolutely. need to understand that they're in that 100-foot zone and they want to do any kind of work, they pretty much need to talk to us. That's a great point, Dan. I think that's really how you'll message it, you know, once, once you get the guidelines there. So. That's a good point. Yes. Any other questions uh, from the board members, the board of selectmen? Anything further from the Conservation Commission members on this topic? Uh, no, I, I think it's terrific. Um, as you know, Randy, I'm all about educating people. So, um, you know, it's a, it's a great. Great, thank you. The uh, next one would be chapter 91 doc permitting uh, procedures and, you know, I think they are talking about education. That's really what this one is about. You know, I know from um, attending and, and listening to the Conservation Commission meetings that when, you know, when someone's looking to do work on their property, you have them file their Chapter 91 permit. And I think that was promulgated by state regs, uh, which is something that um, Conservation Commission is adhering to. So I, I would just put it on here. 
I'm more as a public service announcement than Joey. I don't know if you wanted to talk any more about that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, um, back along, um, we sort of, <clears throat> excuse me, sort of realized that um, the uh, general public was not registering their docs. And this is an entirely different process than what used to be done by the Harbor Master uh, back along. And so what we started to do is we researched the chapter 91 uh, Massachusetts chapter 91, um, I, you know, because I work in the regs, I was familiar with it and realized that we weren't doing it. Um, so you can kind of, you know, please don't shoot the messenger. Um, but um, when it comes to uh, the chapter 91, what we're doing to make it easier for the applicant as well uh, as, um, in, you know, basically save them just a little bit of money um, is if they are fine, if they're doing other work that requires the RDA process or the notice of intent NOI process, we can roll that in um, as part of the project so that before they end up getting their certificate of compliance, um, the, the doc will be registered with the state. Um, this is a state actually mandated licensure program. Um, it's been around since 1860 something. It's one of Massachusetts' oldest laws. Um, and the reason that it is around um, is to protect the, the, the public's interest um, when it comes to waterways. Um, because back along, um, people um, were very, uh, if you had the right, you know, if you, if you needed to fish, follow, or navigate, that was a very important thing back along. Um, and the state has just kept the law intact. Um, it is known that a lot of folks don't know um, about Chapter 91, um, and we're doing the best that we can with educating folks. Um, unlicensed docs, um, by, you know, by DEP standards, uh, they're actually considered a nuisance, um, which is a little bit harsh, um, I think, but it's right in the Chapter 91 regs. Um, as far as um, you know, the process to uh, file, um, basically what you do is you go to the, you can begin by going to the Mass DEP, uh, chapter 91. And um, most of the folks uh, on our, um, our, our lake or, or what is a great pond, um, they will uh, see that there are several different licensure um, uh, links. You're going to want to do the simplified uh, licensure. It's going to ask several questions um, regarding where it's, you're going to need to draw out a picture of your property, where it's going, where the dock is going to go, um, what the measurements of the dock are. Um, you're going to need to uh, know the square footage of that dock. Um, I believe that um, if you are um, uh, I think it's post it's post 1980 something. Um, I can't think of the date, but um, your dock can be 300. Uh, I believe it's 350 square feet. Um, and uh, Randy, as I had mentioned to you, I checked uh, earlier on your dock needs to, and it's not it's not always going to be able to work out this way. Um, but the dock really needs to be set back a minimum of 15 feet from each uh, property boundary. Um, and as we all know, uh, there's a lot of properties on, on the lake that it's not going to be the case. It's going to have to just go right out from the middle. The state, um, the state will understand that, um, but they're going to, what they're going to probably be looking at are, are there any other licensed docks nearby? Um, because part of this, uh, this law is that na uh, navigation is protected and you cannot impede on people's navigation. Um, so that is going to be an important thing. So um, often in these coves uh, on, on the lake, um, you sometimes will find four, uh, four of these guys sticking out and they're, they're somehow you know, they're rigged in there so that everyone has a, a slice of the pie. Um, 
I would, um, I urge anyone that does not have a licensed stock, it's $75 to license it with the state. Uh, it lasts for 70, excuse me, it lasts for 15 years. Um, so if you do the math, it's not really that much um, per year to license. Um, and um, I think that is um, pretty much it. You can only actually have one, um, one per uh, one doc per uh, deed. So um, that is one doc per uh, property. Um, and that's right in the, in the uh, standards. Um, if there are any questions, um, you know, definitely feel free to partner with, with conservation. We're here to help. Um, we can get you through the process. Um, Michelle, you, you've um, done a great job with um, assisting a lot of people um, through, the, through the process. Um, do you have, did I, have I missed anything? No, I think you've covered the basics. The, other yeah. than the dock has to be four feet wide and can't be any wider than that. Yes, that's, that's true. Four feet wide um, and no, no larger. And the other thing too is you, you're not supposed to have a cover um so it can't be like a built structure um so um i know that there are a lot of folks that have docks that have um a, you know a, a built roof on them um at least when you file you cannot have that on there um but um it's uh it's very important that you um you do end up uh filing Oh, and Joey, there might be one other point, which is a dock includes any kind of boat lift or jet ski lift as well, not just dock you walk on. Yes, that's true. Um, we did, uh, with my organization where I work professionally, uh, DEP uh, did a wonderful, uh, Nancy Lynn, uh, one of my colleagues from DEP had done a training on Chapter 91 at a conference uh, two years ago. Um, and I believe Kelly uh, actually loaded the uh, slideshow onto uh, our website. So it's, it's laid out very nicely, um, really very simple to read um, and understand um, how, to, how to get uh, your license done and why it's important. Thank you. Um, uh, I was just going to add real quick, Joey and Mary, uh, we talked a lot about education. And so if you guys want to use any of the town resources like our social media pages or even putting something in the utility bills, uh, that's certainly something we can do and uh, make happen. All right. Wonderful. Thank you, Doug. I appreciate that. And not, not to put a lot of work on Mary or whoever handles the web page, but again, there may be a link um, so people can find the simplified license easier, that, that might be helpful. Absolutely. I think the chapter 91 information has been up there for, for a while, but this is a new document that, um, I, you know, I had sent it off to you, Randy, if, um, you know, folks want to look at it on our website or, or um, you know, uh, it really is a nice uh, PowerPoint that covers the uh, licensure program. Any other questions on the chapter 91? discussion. Uh, let's move on to the proposed wetland bylaw discussion. Again, here it was an opportunity for the Board of Selectmen to provide some, some input on it, you know, not in the form of a public hearing, which is really under the auspices of the Conservation Commission. I know you've had one already on Zoom. Um, so why don't I open it up now, if I could, to questions from uh, the Board of Selectmen. I don't know if you might want to start. Yes, I had a quick question. So I was just looking on uh, the first page under two for jurisdiction and item 2.3, where we're identifying um, great ponds of the Commonwealth and adjoining lands out to a distance of 200 feet. I was looking at the state's wetlands Protection Act, and I couldn't find anything specifically addressing great ponds. It seemed to me that they addressed two areas, 
river banks, which are out to 200 feet, and then all others up to 100 feet. So I was just wondering where we came up with the, the um, idea where, that it was 200 feet for a great, great ponds. Where that came from, Andrew, is um, it's, it's actually kind of interesting, inter interesting the way wetlands are classified and the way that they are delineated. You need to have two things under Army Corps. Um, you need to have, um, you have to have hydric soils and you have to have uh, hydrophilic uh, um, vegetation. Um, so if you've got both of those and you've got a wetland, under the regs, and it's going to sound strange, anything that is, if you find a wetland and it's, you trace it down, it's actually not non-jurisdictional. But if you trace that, well, you find a wetland and you trace up, um, then you've got a jurisdictional wetland. Anything up gradient is a jurisdictional wetland. So what we were doing was, in, with this, this was to um, help to bring into our jurisdiction um, a lot of the aquifers, uh, excuse me, a lot of the um, uh, small, um, very small creeks, um, a lot of the isolated wetlands where, um, you know, the, the water is just bubbling up out of the ground. Um, uh, you know, a lot of um, very small, anything smaller than 15 feet, um, believe it or not, is not considered jurisdictional for us. Um, so, um, you know, you might have water pop up out of the ground, travel for 12 feet and then pop back in the ground. That ends up not being jurisdictional for us. So, so with that, we're able to um, encompass and protect a lot of that, uh, those wetlands that are feeders for our lake. Yeah, I, I, my only comment um, is that I think people will look at this as uh, overreaching from what the state promulgated in 10.02, uh, 310, 10.02, which seemed clear to me that it was 100 feet. So I just put that out there as something that I think you will find people pushing back on that. As, as I read the regs, and I'm not an expert, yeah, we, what we did was um, we felt that 200 feet was appropriate because the Riverfront Act is 200 feet. So we matched it up with the River, Riverfront Act, which is an overlay of the Wetlands Protection Act. And it's separate that in a riverfront, which would be a perennial stream, brook, or river, um, we have a 200 foot jurisdictional it's different. Why was 200 feet chosen, that, that particular distance? Um, I, that's what the legislature and DEP came up with as, as, a, as a number for 200 feet. When it comes are you to- asking about the, about the riverfront, are you asking about 200 feet? Why was it chosen for the lake? For the lake. Well, for the- now Great you're, park. Yeah, that's the great point. Yeah, yeah, that's what I had just explained. But again, my only point is that you know I think if people go and take the time to look at the regs, they're going to see it as kind of a reach um, from the Conservation Commission now is looking to um, be involved with anything not just a hundred feet, I'll call it from the banks of the shore, but now two hundred feet. So I'm I'm simply saying, you know, people may push back. You may you may get citizenry in input on that. Could you, say, could you explain why is it is it 200 feet, Joe? Um, we had done 200 feet so that we can pull in um, any kind of isolated wetlands um, and any kind of small, um, you know, small uh, wetlands that could have, um, they usually have uh, some sort of vernal pool activity potentially. Um, there are some small little um, uh, bubbling, uh, you know, the fissures that are in a lot of the, the bedrock uh, outcropping that's on like particularly the Gore area, um, lower Gore area. You get a lot of the water that seeped down from up top 
um, and right down around the lake, you tend to get, those are feeders to, to the lake. And we were looking to protect those um, and just have it pulled in, you know, it, it would extend the, the buffer zone just another hundred feet. So, so I want to make sure I'm understanding correctly, Joey. So currently the way the state uh, regulations read, those areas would not be subject to Wetlands Protection Act, but by extending the buffer zone by an additional 100 feet, it then allows at the local level for us to regulate something that would not normally be regulated by the state, correct? That's correct. Like say, uh, for example, Andrew, you lived um, out of the 100 foot uh, buffer zone and you had a wet depression in your yard and say you're um, 175 feet from the nearest wetland, um, which may be, you know, a larger swamp. It could be a small creek. It could be actually the lake itself. Um, a, small, a small wet depression, um, which is considered isolated wetlands, are not, right now we don't have jurisdiction to protect those. And a lot of those end up having, um, a, you know, they're just like with the other wetlands, they have um, important ecological function um, and can often be, have uh, harbor vernal pool activity in them. I just, uh, Joey, didn't we, um, I mean, I think the 200 foot was, was just for the great pond, right? Um, but also doesn't this bylaw include, it also protects other isolated wetlands, which are not protected in the act, right? Such as vernal pools. Yes, vernal pools. If it looks like a vernal, if right now, if a vernal pool has been certified by natural heritage, that, that will get the 100 foot protection for us. So that would fall under our jurisdiction. So if um, a resident, um, you know, someone uh, you know, uh, some sort of scientist goes out um, and certifies a vernal pool, gets an automatic protection, and, and it is pulled in right now into our jurisdiction. Um, but for right now, that's not the case. So under this bylaw, if it is a, if it looks a lot, of, a lot of what we did was we mimicked a lot, of, a di couple of different towns, um, and. If it looks like a, a vernal pool and potentially acts like a vernal pool, it's considered a vernal pool and we'll treat it as such during the permitting process. So we would be asking people to be as far away from that vernal pool area as possible. And, and I think now under 310 CMR, that's a hundred foot uh, for, for vernal, for, Vernal pools. If it's certified. If it's not certified, sure. no protection. Um, I did have one other suggestion on, on the first page. Um, if you look under again the section jurisdiction, the second line at the bottom and at the end of that line, it says or otherwise alter, just a suggestion that you put in parentheses as defined in 310 CMR. Yes, alter alter okay, that's a very good definition in 310 CMR that people will better understand what that means. Absolutely. And that is, um, you know, for all of, for anyone uh, that's going to end up viewing this or for all of you selectmen, alter is a huge, that is a very loaded word when it comes to um, wetlands protection and the regs in the act itself. Um, any kind of, any kind of alteration triggers an, a filing for conservation. So that would be um, putting a structure somewhere it shouldn't be, um, at even adding loam to um, an area that is adjacent to a swamp. Um, that could be, it could be a many different things. Trimming, you know, cutting down a whole bunch of brush and not realizing that um, you're actually cutting in a wetland and you can't be doing that. So the term alter is very important. 
Anything else on page one? <laughs> Hopefully, it won't take this long to go through every page. I actually had a general question before we go page yeah. by page. Lisa's got a general question. I don't know if you can hear me. Um, I was just curious after your last Zoom meeting when you first went through the um, the bylaw, I was just curious if you could summarize like the top three to five um, pieces of feedback you received after that meeting from residents. I was just curious in terms of the kinds of questions, what were like the top three to five areas that people had the most question or concern with? Um, you know, I'll be honest with you, Lisa. Um, you know, probably one of the biggest questions that we had was how will that um, bordering vegetated strip um, that people tend to get, they got confused about, um, the, you know, how does that impact me? Why is that important? Um, you know, is it necessary? Um, and that is something that we're probably going to go back to the drawing board and probably end up taking that out. Um, that was a method um, that was being used if, if you've got a, a steep slope, you have the potential for a lot of runoff. So the last, um, you know, based on how, how large your lot is would d dictate how big that strip should be. Um, and in most cases, it would only be five feet um, based on lot size. Um, the bigger your lot was, it would be a little bit bigger. And what that border vegetated buffer zone was, was our, we were trying to, because we're losing so much vegetation, so many trees, so many, um, you know, so many shrubs um, around the lake, and that is contributing to um, significantly to um, the the rise in temperature of the lake year after year, which is not good. Um, you know that promotes bacterial growth um, as well as fish kills um, and, and many other um, issues. Um, but it also, you know, that it's a last line of defense so that we can get any kind of pollutants um, or erosion to be stopped before entering the resource area. And so an example of that, if I remember right in the table, um, if you had a small lot, it was five feet and then 25 feet. So that five feet was kind of the question, why are you, why are you adding the five feet? Or if you get a bigger lot, why are you going to 10 feet? You know, does that mean I have to plant a whole bunch of um, native species, bushes and stuff in that five feet in order to do work? So I, I remember hearing a lot of comments. I listened. Yeah. Um, and there were a lot of comments. People, um, I think, were a little bit um, taken back by it. Um, one particular resident, you know, he didn't have very much of a backyard. Um, and um, it was really, you know, it was understandable that he was, uh, you know, like, if I have to redo my retainer wall, do I have to, put, I have to now vegetate my entire backyard? I don't want to do that. And, you know, I think the, the, what we missed in that presentation because we were moving through so much new stuff was that that only was for um, homes that are brand new. Um, so they're, they're, they're new development, potential redevelopment, or if, um, you know, I, I guess, yeah, potential development, more like cantilever houses where they're still building in the same, uh, cellar hole, but they're building the house a bit bigger, that's when it would end up tripping that. So it was more, you know, and I think that with a lot of people asking like, geez, if I, if I have to, you know, redo my stairs, or if I have to do this or just small stuff, I got to now do this. And that's not that, that, that was not the case. And um, I'll be honest, I think we missed a step with educating the public on that. Okay. Um, but I'm surprised that folks didn't get a little bit more um, flustered about it. Um, but um, it, uh, you know, I, I think that that meeting um, went very well, um, considering we're presenting something very, um, you know, something that's, that's new um, 
and we're, we're thinking, um, we've just kind of designed something that is um, taking the regs and overlaying the regs, but expanding, um, not necessarily an overreach of power, but it brings more into the scope of the Conservation Commission as local regulators. And what we do is we look at, all right, you're looking to do this project. How is this project going to, what is it going to do to that potential resource? Is there a major alteration occurring near it? Um, how far away is it? Where are the different, uh, you know, if there's a well, um, if there's a stream, a river, you know, what, what have you. And the purpose of having a bylaw is to expand a bit on what you are already have as regulations and to be able to expand your, your protections. And, you know, we've got, it's not, you know, I mean, it's the lake is our biggest resource by far. It's our crown jewel. Um, but we also have a lot of beautiful areas in our town, um, you know, that have some really nice streams and brooks. And, um, you know, we want to protect those areas. Um, we don't want to necessarily, um, you, didn't, you know, deny development, but be able to condition development a little bit better so that it, uh, you know, that it's, um, it's pr pr protection. That's, I mean, really the main thing and of the aid interests of the Wetlands Protection Act. I think um, Joey, with regards to that example, that particular person had 200 feet of wall. Yeah. So five feet, you know, it's a thousand square feet of, of change along the border of the lake. So I, I remember that conversation. Any, anything else on um, on page two? We talked about that 100 foot um, down in the bottom of that page two already. 100 foot versus 200 feet. And I know on page three, there is a depth, you do carry forward the definition of alter. So I, I think, I think you know, you pulled it right from 310 CMR, so at least it is described so. Yeah, you will find that this has several pages of definitions. Mo a lot of it is definitions. And we were, um, when developing this, we wanted to make sure that if someone came across any kind of word that could be considered potentially arbitrary. We wanted to make sure that it's clear what we are considering as a definition for this. Yeah, I think there were six pages of definition, so. Yes, um, it's, and that's actually common in a lot of bylaws. I'm gonna ask the um, selectmen members, uh, the next question I have was on page 13. Does anyone have any questions? On the, on the document prior to page 13. And, and I'd also encourage the selectmen and the public, if they do have questions, just send a note in to Mary. And she can share those you know, with the Conservation Commission when this is you know, brought up again for this. Absolutely. And you know, I just want to let the, the select board and, and Doug know that um, you know, uh, Commissioner Shirillo, Commissioner Jewell, um, and myself, um, we're the, we're the working group on this, so um, we are you know going to be getting together and and having a roundtable, whether it's Zoom or whether it's together, um, and and start to you know look to pull you know probably pull some some of the stuff out of here that's confusing um, and refine things. Randy, um, selectman. The other thing we're doing, I mean, I'm learning, just your questions were great. I'm learning from them. I'm not the expert on technical stuff either, though I've spent about 50 hours on uh, the, um, I don't know, we call it educational stuff. But we're also doing a grassroots effort. Joey and I talked about it, talked about it with yeah. Mary, talked about Michelle, I'm gonna call um, Fred. Um, we've got a meeting with the Kildare Island Club that Joe's been invited to, and we, I mentioned it to Mary. And Michelle, we exactly what you're doing tonight. 
this is what we want. Okay, there, there really were um, falsehoods spread over and over. I, I have to have fixed my retaining wall. Okay, and we really want to make it so that people just exactly what Joey explained. It's, you know, I want building. I don't want anyone to think I'm going to stop business. I, but if we could get maybe not here, a little bit here, maybe the 15 feet extra is maybe it should be just 10. But do you want a, a lake where no one wants to build on it at all because all these pollutants got into it? He's got science behind him. I mean, the, this is what we're trying to do is keep the lake the popular place it is. And this climate change, like he said, it's warmer. There's been more um, chemicals put in because we have to with the weeds from the Lake Association. But again, we want to we want to make sure everything keeps this lake healthy. But th this kind of civil dialogue that you're doing tonight, I, I in February, I'm wondering what the heck did I get myself into? It was like a lynching mob at that other uh, the nasty remarks. And like I said, I'd be the last person who'd want any builder or realtor feel that we don't want building on the lake. We just want to make sure it's in better, but we're, better guidelines. But we're going to, like I said, Kilder Island Club, 10 or 15 people were at that meeting completely against it. Well, I've given, and then ultimately, once you've got your education, you know, it's the voting booth. It doesn't have to be this negative, hostile atmosphere that's been developed about this. <laughs> So, and I've got, you know, friends from Lake Association, everybody, it's not a, it's not a cookie cut, okay? Every, some people actually want more. They want more than the 15 feet. And other people say somewhere in the between, as is, maybe not as, so again, there's a lot of different views, but this kind of civil dialogue is what at least I've been looking for and we've I've talked with, with commissioners. So thank you so much for having this meeting because this is what we need. You're welcome, and, and I think it's a great idea to reach out to WLA and Kilder Island Club. Right, That's right and other like church, St. Louis Church. I mean, I mean, different groups of people. It's not if you have a whole ton of people that are in a small group that are negative, it tends to be a negative discussion. Okay. All right. I everyone, everyone has the. I'm sorry, Joey. Everyone has the best interest of Lake at heart, and I think if we all keep that in our minds, we'll make the right decisions. So. Absolutely. And, you know, it's, it's, um, I think the initial, um, you know, the initial hesitation and um, the initial um, negativity probably came from the fact that they didn't know what was going on and why. Um, and, um, you know, that is something that we're going to put our best foot forward with educating people and uh, helping them understand um, why. And, um, you know, hopefully convince a lot of people that, you know, thinking, um, you know, not necessarily in the now, but for the future. Um, you know, I'm sure there's a lot of folks in this community that have a wonderful home and they want to be able to pass it on to the next generation and, let them enjoy it as much as they did without, you know, potential, um, you know, issues that, you know, a, a conservation commission's um, role is, is protection. Um, so um, we're not looking to deter development um, or be a, a pain, but we're, we're condi we condition development. And that's usually the best way that I explain that to people. What, what does a commission really do? Well, we, we permit and condition development. But sometimes development, depending upon the project, it's not feasible. Can I make a comment? Yeah. Um, you know, I would just like to say a general thing about the bylaw. Um, we have a project before us right now, which is, me, to me, the perfect example of why this town really needs a bylaw. On Cudworth Road, they're thinking of putting in, I don't know, it's like 200 parking spots, right? And because of the way the state reg reads, um, they can put that, um, like along the lake, we have the zoning, which at least gives you 10 feet away from the water. But the way the state reads for this wetland, they can build, according to the state reg, they can build that parking lot right up to the edge of the wetland. 
And I mean, we can give them this guideline. We would like to see it like at least 25 feet back or 50 feet back, but they you know, can appeal to the state and the state would probably permit this. And it's, you know, it's, to me, it looks a little bit like we're having trouble with LKQ. And that huge parking lot is causing a lot of problems. And that's a similar situation where they built right up to the edge of the wetland and there was no, no real planning for that. So it's just, it's just concerning. There's a lot of development going on, which is causing, I think it's gonna cause the town trouble in the future. And in my experience of working with other towns, most towns or many towns do have bylaws which give a little bit of extra protection, 25 feet or 50 feet. Um, not necessarily, I mean, I'm not used to working with towns with lakes. So this is more like, you know, out in the woods, that kind of stuff. Um, I think the lake could certainly be treated separately. That's just my, my concern is, is these large wetland areas in town and, and what's going to happen there. Okay, what do you, um, I think, um, cause we're running a little short on time. Um, I know page 13, did anyone have anything prior to page 13? Anyone on page 13? Uh, just, just one comment that, uh, uh, some of the concerns of the public were in the additional studies area, and s some of the concerns I heard were small projects. Uh, you know, when would they require additional studies for something that that is a small? What they the landowner considers a small project, and they're concerned that by doing a small project, they'd have to do studies. Um, you know, that's a good uh, that that's a really good point, um, Tom. Under, we had, we had to put that into the bylaw because if you read the regs, the, the regs read that a conservation commission can, if they, if they think that a project is going to have adverse impact or significant alteration to a habitat, which is a protection, a protected um, uh, interest, uh, or to water, um, there's, you know, if, if there's going to be a major adverse impact, we can commence and ask for a, whether it's a wildlife study or an environmental, uh, an actual environmental impact study. Um, I can tell you right now, it's, it is not common um, and we would never put that undue stress on a, ve a very small project. It's not worth it. Um, larger projects are typically what, where you're looking to do those kinds of studies. They are costly um, because you've got scientists running numbers and doing studies and, and what have you. But when you're looking at, you know, um, you know, for example, the, the, the lake and doing, um, you know, doing a lot of um, management of the invasives. It's really important that eventually, um, you know, it doesn't need to happen every single time you file, but maybe every, you know, every other time a filing is done, there needs to be a study. How, how are the methods impacting wild, wildlife? How are they impacting um, our natives, how are they impacting what we're looking to, um, you know, what we're looking to eradicate? Um, are there any other adverse impacts that these methods could be, could be having? Um, could they be um, adding to algae blooms? Could they be killing a lot of the trees that are adjacent to, to the water? I mean, I'm just using that project because that's one of the largest projects we've got going on. Um, when we were looking at the solar projects, um, they, they have, I mean, you had to do an environmental impact study um, because it's huge, but we would never do that um, on small, small projects. Um, sometimes a wildlife study, if we think that there could be important species in there, um, but the, a wildlife study is a much, much smaller, um, you know, it's, it's just, really just, you know, maybe a couple thousand dollars versus, you know, serious five, five or six figures. I would, I would just suggest that uh, when you're doing the, ed when you put together some education that you consider uh, this particular area in educating the public. Yeah. I've heard the same thing about the studies. A lot of people yeah. have asked about the studies. The studies are a big concern. 
Andrew? Yeah. Well, mine was just on um, section D, and I think um, Joey's explanation from earlier on the the licensing for the docks through the yeah. DEP. I just, I, my opinion is um, section D might need to be worded a little bit differently. Yes. So that you're letting people know that as like you had explained to me or to the board that you're trying to do a favor to get them an application using the simplified waterways license. And if they want to go that route, then the dock has to be under 600 square feet or less. Yeah. Because that's the requirement to do the simplified. But if they want to go over 600 square feet, then they actually have to do a full chapter 91 license. Well, they have to do the, the larger one, which is for marinas. And as far as, I'm, uh, as far as I know, I don't think any of our marinas are, are licensed. Uh, the only one in town that did go through the full chapter 91 is Indian Ranch. Okay. And that's a newer one. So yeah. um, some of the others, like I, I will probably bet that, um, you know, uh, uh, Sue over at... Um, uh, Lakes, uh, Lakeview Marine. Her, you know, her father's had that there for a long time, probably prior to uh, 19, 1984, I think yeah, it is. They have a 99 uh, year it's older than me. Yes, yeah, so it's gonna, the, what they'll do is they'll, have, they'll do the filing and then the state will say, you're grandfathered, you don't have to file right. again. Yeah. And I know um, back a few, several years ago, there was a Dark Lake Policies and Procedures Committee that was started up as well, but I had attended a, a few meetings and I know that it was concerned about marinas popping up in residential areas. And at the time, the town, I don't know, think the bylaw ever got passed, but we were, when we looked into it with the state, the attorney general said, well, it's a great fund. You really can't regulate anything on the, in the water, but the town could regulate off street parking. And that's where at one point the town was thinking of doing a bylaw in the residential area saying, if you were to have more than one dock slip, you'd have to have one, an additional off street parking for each additional slip. But I don't think that ended up going anywhere. Yeah, I don't think anyone pushed it, but I do know that is a common complaint that I hear. Uh, but there's nothing that the town can do because it's a great plan. The only thing we could do is if we, you know, we petition the legislature to do what they did at Quinsic, you know, but then you're talking um, lake commissions and very stringent uh, policies. So I don't think anyone wants to go there. I think if people feel it's an issue with um, people renting out slips, which I know happens all over, um, then they should go the the way that Andrew is suggesting. Um, put a bylaw together and, and you know explain it to the public and if it passes that will take care of it. And I know the simplified waterways is 10 slips or less for, for that particular purpose. So on, on page 13 under that section D the last uh, four lines uh, I would only comment the setback of 25 feet I think that's been clarified um, Joey, you mentioned 15, that, that didn't, 25 didn't make sense to me. It is 25. Line, and then you couldn't. I have to correct the chairman. It is 25 right in the, um, under the construction section, it is 25. But currently it's 10, so it's an additional 15, right? No. Michelle, could you talk about the just know the Oh, we're talking about we're talking chapter about the blocks. Oh, okay. So it is in the simplified application it's 25 feet in the general application it's 25 feet no less than 15 feet so that is accurate the chairman well the only thing to is if you have a 50 foot lot you technically can't put a dock in because say you have a three foot dock right. and you only have 50 feet you, you physically cannot do it so there's got to be some <laughs> Way yes, to work there around is, that, there that's is a, that's some important. wiggle room, but we try to keep it centered in those situations. Yeah. 
So, Michelle, just, just so I'm clear, so you're seeing this in the application, not in the regulation? No, it's in the regulation as well. Under construction, if you look at the application, section 9A under construction specifically says 25 feet. So, I'm sorry, under the regs, what would it be? 310? Um, That's actually 310, section 9. Section 9? Okay. Well, could you uh, fix that by just saying uh, 25 feet from the property line to the center of the dock? Well, yep. it, yeah, I mean, it, it will be consistent with what is in the, um, in the chapter 91 regs, yeah. Um, so, and we can have that citation in there. Thank you. I, I, obviously, Tom is more of an engineering type because he figured the solution. Okay. Um, the other, the other question that I had on uh, on page thirteen um, dealt with maximum dock length. I, I couldn't find anything in the regs on maximum dock length. Um, I know for a fact that there are several docks that have to be. 50, 60 feet, they're not impinging on navigation, um, but they want to be able to put a boat in, especially now, given that the lake is about two feet low, without so having the, a long dock. The restrictions are square footage and that right. no dock can go any further than one quarter of the distance between the land. So on a cove, you can't have a really long dock because you're going beyond one quarter of the way across. Okay, um, again there, Michelle, the, the citation there is chapter 91 regs, is that section nine as well? Okay. Uh, I, I don't recall, I looked it up earlier, I could send it to you if you want. Yeah, yeah. if you don't mind, just if you can send it um, to Courtney, Courtney can send it to all the, all the selectmen, that'd be great, thank you. Okay. And then the other question I'm assuming in there as well, Michelle, is the, uh, the one dock per, per parcel, because I couldn't find that either. Yes, it is. Yeah, I had seen that as well. And then if you look at that PowerPoint I sent Randy um, from DEP, it actually says one per property and it's highlighted. It's in one of the slides. Yeah, I, I know you sent it this afternoon. I didn't get a chance to look at it yet. Yep, no problem. Any other questions on 13? I guess I'm going to give it maybe five more minutes, and other than that, we'll send questions and writing to the, the other the commission. The other thing that I've seen was the requirement for end caps, the dock to have permanent reflective markers facing outwards into the sides. Um, that yeah, that is um, more out of um, a, more of a safety feature that we were looking to have folks, you know, put some reflectors on the end of their docks. Um, for night navigation. I know I would suggest not, but Andrew, go ahead. Yeah, my, my only concern is with the, 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 the reflectors on docks is, as you may know, may or may not know, boats aren't equipped with headlights like a motor vehicle. They yeah. do have docking lights, but they're only under, the regulations are only supposed to be used at the point of actually docking your boat. You're not supposed to drive with them on as if they were headlights. And I know a majority of the docks on the lake are aluminum, which is in and of itself reflective in, in, na in its own nature. Okay. Yeah, we can, I mean, we can remove that. That, that was just more we were thinking um, on uh, as a safety. Yeah, no, I, I understand the, sa the safety concern because I, I have seen in the state regulations where if it's a float or a mooring and not a dock, then those do require the yes. reflective yeah. reflectors because then it becomes a navigational hazard because somebody may not be expecting that float or mooring to be out as far as it is. Absolutely. Yeah. So in that case, then it, it absolutely makes sense to put a reflector on that because then it becomes a navigational hazard. Uh, on page 14, I just had one comment under the expiration of permits. I know that 
Um, there have been some discussion between CONCOM and Webb's Lake Association, and I know that their, their uh, permit with regards to uh, treating the lake has been renewed like five times for a total of 15 years. I, I would just offer up that I think, you know, you should, you should give the Conservation Commission a little more leeway. And so I was surprised to see just a one-time a one, uh, renewal. So that's just a suggestion from me, that's all. Um, I will, with that, Randy, um, let you know that um, when talking, I had a conversation with uh, DEP a while back. Um, you know, it obviously is the discretion of the commission whether um, whether you whether you uh, you know renew a, a permit. Um, DEP um, urges uh, that to not happen, and they like to see a refiling. Um, but we thought that it would be fair that you know one you know if you needed another three years to get your project done, then that's you know we thought that that you know just a one time, and it would alleviate this this situation of you know repeated renewal renewal. I mean. Um, can, you know, continuing the permit, the same permit. Yeah, I'm, I'm simply saying, you know, why tie your hands? That's all. If, you, if you've okay. got it in the bylaw, your hands are tied. Okay. Um, any other questions on, I think one, one comment I know that I had mentioned to Joey was maybe the um, Conservation Commission can think about when they're discussing this again um, is with regards to a 25 foot setback, maybe you look at a foundation um, with, with regards to when you're putting a new building in, new house, make sure it's a minimum. If you're going to propose something, make sure that the foundation is a minimum of 25 feet. Because, you know, I, I, I think I've told you I've taken my own survey, it's unofficial. Um, you know, I haven't gone through and and taking a tape measure to every single property on the lake. But at my count, there were 24 lots that were still available to be built on. And of the lots that have um, buildings on them, roughly 50% of them, this is the average of South Pond and Middle Pond, because I never made it to North Pond yet to do the unofficial survey. 48% of South Pond and Middle Pond appear to be within 25 feet of the lake, that would be part of their house, whether it's a deck or a walkway leading up to a deck, something attached to the house. So, you know, I think that that um, just might be a suggestion you might want to think of um, when, you're, when you're discussing this further. Okay. Uh, I know it's getting a little late, 7.15. Any other questions? Uh, Mr. Help? Chairman, uh, while we wrap up, I just want to let everyone know that uh, our office has put out a survey to everyone that has uh, gone before one of our regulatory boards, so the planning board or the ZBA or conservation. We didn't get a whole lot of responses back, but the ones that we did were overwhelmingly positive. And a lot of people, uh, especially said that uh, Mary has been very easy to work with and they appreciate the time that she did to uh, make the process understandable for them. So thank you, Mary, and I wanted to give you a, a shout out for that. Yay, Mary! Um, it's, I mean, I, uh, if you've been to one of my meetings, you know, at the end of every single meeting, I thank Mary and I thank every single one of my board members for um, what they do. Um, it is not always easy. Um, you know, conservation in a municipality sort of beats to a different drum. And often people don't seem to understand that. Um, and, uh, you know, the more, um, you know, we can do to help service the public and have them understand um, uh, the better. And that's what, um, you know, that's what this board is uh, very, you know, we're being very proactive on that. Yeah. Um, you know, unfortunately, I know that we've had a few um, situations in the past that have, um, I think it was more in the early part of changing and adjusting some things so that we could be consistent. Um, 
you know, there was a lot of negative negativity going around about, um, you know, that we're hard to work with and that we, um, you know, we're just sort of going around and just enforcing people and, um, you know, that's not, that's not the case. We look to work with every single person. Um, you know, we want to get them going down the right road, um, but it has to be a two-way street. Um, and, um, you know, orders of conditions um, are absolutely key when you have a, an open project with us. Um, that is a legal document that holds you accountable for what you have agreed to with the commission. Um, so I can't, uh, I can't express that enough uh, to the public that that's really, really important. Um, but um, Mary does um, a, a tremendous job um, with the little time that she does have. Um, and um, it really is a joy to be on the board with her, um, but also we're, we're lucky to have her in our, our municipality. Here's another thing that I'd like to say to the selectmen is sometimes we've done our job with the state regulations, just like you're asking, and then a neighbor gets in and there's been neighbors that have really drilled some of these builders. I mean, one builder, he's had the luck of Job in the last six months. So I'm hoping everything's okay, but we're responding to the neighbors too, not just our job requirement. But I'm just so happy to see that this, because I, I just haven't seen a lot of negativity in the six months with the exception of discussion with the bylaw. I think we explain things, why and where, so some of, I'm glad that you're seeing it now. And I think that's another great idea is have things in writing. So not to reprimand, just how can you get better? And Doug's idea of um, the, uh, what, what, what did he say? The survey. Oh, the social media? Yeah. yeah, it's right in writing. So if there's something we did we shouldn't have done, we can learn from it and change it. And, and I would point out that if we get the neighbors to understand what's actually going on on the project, they start, they start uh, relaxing and not being so panicky, which in turn helps the build, is going to help the builder. Otherwise, they're going to be calling up about every little thing. Oh. And oh, it's time well spent. Oh. I, I, agree, I agree, Fred. It's, you know, communication is important. And um, that's why there are, there are times you have public hearings for the neighbors to, you know, to speak up. Um, but then after the public hearing, people are doing their work. Um, you know, there's, there's a balance, of course, like anything else, but more communication is certainly better than, than less, I agree. Yeah. So I, I, do, I do want to close it out, but Joey, if I could ask you, um, does, one of the big questions is, um, does the commission, have you made a decision as to whether or not you're going to make changes and then put this forth at the October hearing? Or make sure you just, if you could just address that at your next meeting, because people are wondering. Yeah, I'm going to um, connect with um, Robin and Michelle within uh, within the next probably 24 hours, um, and at least get a meeting going, um, and look at what we need to sort of tear out and add in and readjust, and um, we'll probably have a better idea. Um, you know, I would think in the in the coming weeks. I know that it's um, you know. I'm against that. We're yeah. in a very different time. I don't know if this will make it to November, yeah. um, which, you know. COVID, and like I said, I'm trying to do a lot of grassroots. And it, mm. people in Kildare have definitely changed their opinion about it. Because there were about 15 people at that February meeting, and they're now softer. They're not convinced, but that's why Joey and whoever's going to go to that meeting. So yeah, I, I just don't suggestion. think we have the time. What? Yeah, Did you my say? suggestion to the chair is we don't talk about that now. It's not okay. really an agenda item. Right. Absolutely. Uh, sorry. sorry. Zoe can, and Michelle can deal with getting it on an agenda and um, you, know, you can put it on. So I think, you know, with that, I would, I would also thank Mary and, and thank Joey and the commissioners. And uh, hopefully this was helpful. Absolutely. Was, I mean, it's, definitely. Definitely. It's great. Um, and I hope that, you know, by talking through some of these things that, um, you know, hopefully you folks have learned some things. Um, you know, I, I know um, often people think that we're just um, a group of uh, volunteers and we have no background or, or what have you, but, um, you know, Mary has obviously some 
extensive training in this, and I have a master's of environmental science that specializes in climate change and uh, wetlands uh, ecology. So, um, you know, um, when it comes to these, you know, when it comes to protection, I, I understand what I'm doing. So, um, you know, I, that, I hope that that alleviates some people thinking that there's just someone that's looking to grab power. Uh, thank you all for your volunteerism. Any other thoughts? Uh, thank you. Okay. So, Joey, maybe you could um, conclude your meeting and, and adjourn, and then we'll just continue. Absolutely. Can I, uh, commissioners, can I get a motion for adjournment, please? I motion we adjourn. All right. Robin, and can I get a second? I'll second. Fred with the second. Mary, can you pull us? Um, Robin. Yes. Adjournment. Fred. Yes. Michelle. Yes. I guess we lost Dan. Joey. Yes. Okay. All right. Thank you all. Have a good night. Stay Thank safe. You. Stay Thank, safe. Night. Thank you. Have a great evening. So um, next item on the agenda is uh, discussion on early voting information. I want to thank Lisa for bringing this up. Um, she had she'd raised a number of questions. Um, Bob Craver can't be with us because he's involved in the early voting right now. Um, and one of the reasons that we're meeting in the auditorium tonight is the early voting is occurring in the selectmen's meeting room because we have to have a locked, secure place for the machines up there. So that's why we're down here. With that, Doug, you want to? Yeah, I'll uh, hand it out this uh, 2020 elections um, fact sheet. Uh, so we have two upcoming elections. So the primary, which is happening on September 1st, and then we have obviously the election in November with the big ticket being the presidential uh, election. Uh, so uh, just going down these timelines real quick, real quick the, um, uh, we still have a couple of days if people want to uh, apply to vote by mail or absentee, they have until August 26th. Uh, we also are currently having early voting. So that started over Saturday. Uh, right now we have a, the rest of this week during business hours and then uh, on Tuesday, September 1st, polling will be held here in the auditorium uh, from 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. Any questions on those timelines? Okay. Uh, the November election, very similar. Uh, you have uh, October 24th, register to vote. October 28th, you can vote by mail application deadline. And then we have two weeks of early voting and then the uh, actual election day is Tuesday, November 3rd. Uh, so there's been a lot of the media going on about uh, absentee voting and mailing in and uh, a lot of different stuff going on there. So in Massachusetts this year, the absentee ballot and the mail-in ballot and the early voting ballot is all the same. So there is no difference. Uh, the state did send out cards to all the registered voters uh, just basically saying if you want to vote by mail or absentee, which are used interchangeably here in Massachusetts now, uh, that you can submit the card to your local clerk's office and they will get you registered and they will make sure that you get a ballot. Uh, so we had a lot of people that uh, uh, took that route, over 1,200 people. Um, and that was um, actually a, a couple of weeks ago. So it's probably much more than that now. Uh, Previously, you had to be have an excuse, like you were unavailable, you were incarcerated, or for some other reason to get an absentee ballot, but this year they eliminated that requirement. Um, there has been talk nationwide about a universal ballot that would be mailing a ballot to every single person. Massachusetts has not done that. We're just uh, going with the, you have to apply and uh, request a ballot to be sent to you. And uh, that's all promulgated more so by state law. Yep, yeah, exactly. Uh, one of the other questions is when will the ballots be ready? Uh, the primary election is currently available. They expect the general election ballots to be received here at Town Hall around October 5th, and those will be mailed out shortly after that. Uh, so if you are planning to vote by mail for the primary, you need to make sure that the town clerk has it in his office by 8 o'clock on September 1st. So uh, depending on the mail, uh, you may need to mail in two days in advance. Uh, the general election is slightly different. It just needs to be postmarked. Uh, 
uh, by November 3rd, and then it cannot be later than November 6th. So that would be the absolute deadline. Uh, as far as you know, some of our processes for safeguarding ballots, uh, they did get delivered here to Town Hall. We made sure that uh, there was someone able to receive them and they are numbered so we know if any of the ballots were missing and, and did not get delivered. We have a mail drop box out here in front of Town Hall. Uh, the town clerk and Tim, the finance director, the only two that have keys to that. So they, it's very much controlled and uh, if Tim gets any ballots, he immediately gives them to the town clerk. So that is uh, as well as can be controlled. Um, so yeah, the process to validate any val any ballots, sorry, any ballots is uh, there is a computer program. So when a, a vote is brought in, a ballot's brought in, it's entered into the computer, and you can actually go onto the state's website and see exactly where your ballot is in that process. And then the last thing, um, making sure all our ballots get counted and secured. There was actually a story in my hometown where they lost a box of ballots and they did not get counted. Uh, that was more at, that was at a local election. So it wasn't entered into the computer system. So that couldn't happen with a primary or the general election, but uh, uh, we, we do count them and they are secured and put into the vault once they are uh, all counted through. And, and like you said, they are all locked. Um, that is one reason it's in the selectman's office, also in the selectman's room, because it gives us a lot more room to uh, socially distance when people come in to vote. Uh, typically, early voting all happened in the clerk's office, and it was very, very cramped in there. And it's just a much smoother process, and you don't have to walk past each other. You can one way in and one way out. I have, a question, yeah, I have a question about four, um, four C yep. um, in the list that you handed out. When you say that they validate and the election worker reviews the ballot and enter, enters it into the state database, what exactly are they entering into the database and what are they seeing when they see your ballot? So I guess people would ask, is my vote confidential or is this election worker seeing my vote? Uh, the, the election worker does see a, a, what they voted, um, and it is entered into the computer system that way. So, so Lisa's question is, in this case, Lisa's name on that ballot, no. or is it number? So, so, yeah, it, right. There's no way to identify who was voted. Okay. But they do know that that number is within the string of numbers, and they would check for that to make sure it's controlled. Yep, and that, like that's a, a ballot associated with the town of Webster. Um, so while you're thinking, we did hold our election here in June. That process actually went fairly smoothly with all our COVID restrictions. You can see here we have things set up pretty spread out. We have a lot more plexiglass that we'll put out the day of the election. Uh, and we have, you know, a thousand pens, so <laughs> we should be good. Use your pen and take it home, is that the Yes. <laughs> Yeah, so I just wanted to clarify. So for the general election, if you're voting by mail, you either have to have your ballot postmarked and in the mail no later than November 3rd, or if you're in delivering it to the town hall in the collection box, it has to make it into that collection box no later than November 6th. No, no. so okay. uh, if you're hand delivering it, it needs to be in uh, November 3rd. If you okay. mailed it, had to be postmarked by the third, uh, but we would count it until November 6th. So okay. if for some reason, you know, you lived somewhere very far away and it took more than three days to, to mail the okay. gate here. So it has to be, if you're delivering it by hand, it has to be in by the third. If you're postmarking it, it has to be postmarked on or before November 6th. So if you're okay. vacationing in Hawaii, you put in a postmark by November 3rd, it's not getting here. Yeah, the uh, chances are, six. right. Okay. I just wanted to make sure I understood that yeah. correctly. And clearly the town clerk will be emptying the box on the day, the evening, I'm sure by eight o'clock, he'll be making sure that that box is empty. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, will we be publishing something on the website and through the Facebook page so people are aware? 
Yeah, we can put something similar to this. We have the early voting hours, but we can maybe uh, broaden that a little bit to alleviate any concerns with the ballots and voting. Well, it's a great, you know, public service announcement. So I think you know, the answer questions that otherwise may be asked them mm -hmm. of Bob. So. Yeah, save him a few phone calls. There were a lot today. <laughs> any further questions on the early voting information? Is, is there any timetable from the state? Uh, I mean, this is a statewide regulation, the sixth and post my by the sixth. Yeah, yeah, yeah that, those are all set by the state. All right, someone's trying to get in. Oh, Robin's trying to get back in? <laughs> nope. Uh, we'll see if she really meant to do that. Well, she won't be able to talk to you. Yeah. Um, okay, so the next item on the agenda is vote to open the warrant for the annual town meeting on Monday, October 19th, 2020, at 6 p.m. with a closing date of September 4th, 2020, at noon for submission of articles or citizen petitions. Make a motion to open the warrant for the annual town meeting on Monday, October 19th, 2020, at 6 p.m. with the closing date of September 4th, 2020, at 12. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Courtney, would you pull the board, please? Courtney Claver? Yes. Courtney Fontos? Yes. Courtney Moore? Yes. Courtney Goldberg? Yes. Chairman Yes. Next item is vote to appoint a selectman to the Economic Development Committee. So this would be a selectman appointment of a selectman. That's correct. So one of so, us would, would look to go on. I think uh, Mr. Bork was the previous member. Yeah, and the, the makeup of the committee is defined in the charge of the committee and it specifically mentions having an appointment of the one of the selectmen. Any volunteers first or? I have no problem volunteering for the economic development committee. Okay. Okay. Anybody else want to volunteer? Um, any discussion? Will, will someone, I guess, nominate? I'll nominate Andrew Silver for uh, appointment to the uh, Economic Committee. I'll second. second. A motion is second. Any further discussion? And Courtney, would you pull the board, please? Yes. 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 Okay, the next item on our agenda, thank you, Andrew, for volunteering. I'm just bringing my computer up here. Our next item is the review and amend the committee handbook. Um, I know that Earl, you already put some yeah, comments in back in January, I think. <laughs> so, um, and the, so the committee handbook was actually a great idea by the personnel advisory board. Um, and they, well, we borrowed a lot from the town of Ashland and made a few uh, alterations to make it better fit the town of Webster. Um, and I think actually the board of selectmen had had the opportunity to review this back in maybe last November or December. It's been recently, you know, recently reviewed by two of us. Um, so I don't know if Tom or, or Lisa, if you've had any changes, or if you have, don't have any here, if you can just send them in to uh, Courtney and Doug. I, uh, page two needs to be updated to include Tom. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say that. <laughs> Making sure you're paying attention. I like that. I, I have a question or a suggestion on page 14. The, uh, so Tom, can you hear it for a little bit? Page 14. Yes, I can. Yeah, it, it's, uh, the audience has been very good tonight. Been very good for it says the gender is specific. I'm wondering based on, you know, recent events, if we should be a little specific in this as to, you know, maybe mimic the, the, uh, the meeting laws and the regulations, but uh, it should detail what an agenda should include, like names and Yep. Um, I'm happy to uh, redraft that a little bit to uh, one we can reference that would be meaning a lot, but we can put some of the major points. Yeah, yeah. Uh, 
especially ones that we may have violated in the past. <laughs> Well, we did, I think, you know, in our response, um, which I guess Doug under his town administrative report can let us know about the response, but, you know, clearly we, I missed on those, the conservation commission yeah. message. Yeah. yeah, particularly, I mean, uh, a lot of these chairs could be, have no experience and right. that would be very helpful. I, I think this is a great idea. I, Doug, I had a couple of things. Yep. Um, I think it's on page nine, if I'm satisfied with this correct. There's a spot where we put the listing of the uh, appointed boards and committees, and we generally direct them to the website. Do we know specifically where that is so people can find that? I thought maybe we could just clarify the, the location. Yeah. The they... Yep, I can do that. Um, we do have a, a drop down menu yeah. and it has it, but yeah, we can put a specific link. Yeah. Um, sorry, where on page nine is that? Oh, right here. Okay. Yeah. Yep. And then under uh, A, right below that, I yeah. actually have an observation, and I meant to look back at the past town administrative reports. Do we always have this on the administrative report? Do we consistently? I meant to look back and I didn't have a chance to double check that, but I don't know if we've been consistent on that or have it have we? Yeah. Um, I have actually stopped doing that in the last few. Um, what we do, I could start doing that again. We have it automatically published in the newspaper mm -hmm. uh, every month and then it's automatically on Facebook every month. Um, but yeah, I, will, I can put it in the town administrator's report. I think because I know that's a really hot a, item. Just if you have a section that people can just tap on, yeah, the very it doesn't last. have to be linked with ours, but just yeah. you know, tap on if you want to see a town minister report, yeah. you can get the history of them. It's a great idea. And then under B, um, the one comment I have, and I can't remember which board it was on, but I believe we allowed someone who worked at um, one of the banks in town who wasn't a resident to get appointed to one of the committees and recall that in the last year. And in here, we specifically say a registered voter for volunteers. Yeah, it is the- Yeah, the economic Angela. development, because it specifies in the uh, bylaw that established that, that one of them has to be a business owner right. or employee of a local right. business. So I don't know if we need to clarify this section a bit to, to reflect that there are some nuances. Is that the only exception? So the, another exception that I can think of is if a town employee was on it and they were not a resident. So, uh, yeah, because you do have that. Uh, in here already, um, Hillary, you've got residents that are employed, but you don't have non residents. So we can put something that well, it's just residents a, are preferred, I and mean, it makes sense that it just says any registered voter who's on any full time may apply, but we could seek other people Someone else as well. on these committees without any violation of this statement. That is true. So should I change it just to clarify that a little or just leave it as is? People pressure us why we did, you know, we pointed people. You, know, you, you, can, you can say gen generally, yeah. a red, town resident. I'll add just a little clarification. Lisa, did you have others? I'm You want to go page by page? My next one's on page 12. Okay, page 12. And this is more of a question um, regarding the responsibility of officers um, around the clerk. 
Um, is, is that a standard role that, because I, I don't know if that happens consistently about the reading of public hearings, if that happens by the clerk. Um, is it across various committees? It's just even just in general, you know, I think it's across all committees. I just, is that right. a consistent practice? Is that? That if uh, the clerk, um, yeah, I, I can look into that because there are some committees that they don't even elect a clerk or a secretary. So I mean, most of those don't hold. I just didn't know if that first sentence was really, does that apply or doesn't it apply to people really that read aloud? Yeah. Depending upon really the, the board of the, when they look at this board, we don't have a clerk, we got a secretary, but in actuality, we don't have any. Right. But we, well, you're ultimately responsible for signing things as that officer representative you know, sec secretary because occasionally you know, we have to have things signed for our projects and for the state. Review the public hearing is a practice even on this committee that I didn't do it. Well, maybe, Doug, maybe it should be. I don't know. But it is. Yeah, we'll look at if it must. I. I think it probably does not have to be, but I will double check yeah. that. And if we, uh, I would be okay just eliminating that because uh, yeah, I think one of the reasons why that gave the clerk an actual position or an actual yeah. reason to exist. <laughs> and if they realize the amount of work that Courtney does, they wouldn't want to be clerk yeah. or secretary. <laughs> so I'll double check that line. I was secretary to a building committee. It's a lot of work. Oh. The next page. The signing of the statement of commitment is that actually required for everyone? I do preach. That's actually at the very end, the very last page, page 22. And I think I'm asking that because I'm not sure if I recall when I was sworn in if I actually signed the commitment. Yeah, because this is what we, well, based on Randy's recommendation, we added this uh, a couple of years ago. So I will make sure that the town clerk has lots of copies of these to hand to people when they right. come so when they get sworn in, they actually yeah. get a copy of it and sign it. Yeah, and it reminds them of yeah. you know, what they've signed up for. Yeah, but, and he should hand them a copy of this whole packet, actually. So. Right. Yeah. Take the last page off and yeah. We'll, yeah. we'll do it in PDF, but not kill any trees. I would like to point out page 20 about civil discourse, just so you all remember that as we uh, have our <laughs> upcoming discussions. <laughs> I thought the meeting tonight went very well. It, well yes, tonight's didn't go very well. well. We always have the selectman death of policy too, so. Yeah. Right. And, and we don't refer to that at all here, because it's generic. Is that the reason why that's not in here? It's a specific policy. Yeah. Are you looking for a motion? Or? Yeah, I, I just wanted, I don't think we need a motion. I think um, it was really a matter of getting um, any changes to Doug. If we want a motion, we can certainly have one. But uh, I will. We can, we can have a motion just to say we've approved it, and that way um, we'll know, put it on a calendar for two or three years from now. So that's more or less probably a good idea. I'll make a motion to uh, approve with the changes discussed tonight. I'll second that motion. We have a motion and a second for changes to the policy handbook. Any further questions? Courtney, would you call the board, please? Yes. 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 Yes.
getting really dark in here. <laughs> so. We left it on you because the light's shining. Yeah. All right. Um, I just wanted to reiterate that uh, with the passing of the former town administrator, John McAuliffe, that he was uh, got a lot of work done here in town, and uh, there are a lot of employees that really liked him, and um, uh, he did a lot for the town of Webster, and we're grateful for the service he gave to us here. Uh, these next few bullet points are kind of covered with uh, the election, but right now, just so everyone realizes, I'll reiterate that we are open for um, early voting up at the clerk's office. You can register and then uh, you'll filter through the selectman's office to do the actual voting. And September 7th is Labor Day, coming up way faster than probably most of us uh, expected. Um, and then this last bullet point, the state has mandated water conservation measures. Um, essentially, it's you cannot sprinkle, use your sprinklers during the daylight hours. So uh, hand watering is okay and sprinkles at, sprinklers at night is okay, but uh, not during the day. So with regards to um, Labor Day, that generally means that the lifeguards are not available to go to the... Uh, so we... Labor Day will be the last day that we have uh, lifeguards. You know, you start, you stop charging. Yep. After and the day after Labor Day. Yep. Uh, under public health and safety, uh, reminded that we have our tri-state firefighters meet in September. Uh, the police, we interviewed a lateral transfer candidate from Wilbraham. Uh, he actually is a great guy. Uh, he's been on the force there 10 years, comes with a lot of good experience. Uh, he is actually friends with one of our sergeants here on the force. Uh, he came out to do a ride along just to, he said he was perfectly happy where he was, but he came out here and it just intrigued him because there were so many more things going on, uh, a lot of different specialties he could get into. So he was very much interested and uh, I think he'll be a great fit on the police department. Uh, and the next, this is wonderful news. We only had one positive case last week in the town of Webster. So, uh, Four days in a row with that one, and we're hopefully we can go the whole week. But uh, under finances, uh, we are have developed a plan to spend the majority of the 1.5 million in CARES funding. So uh, that has not been approved yet, uh, and may not be approved to offset lost revenue. Uh, so we are looking at things that we very much needed anyway. Uh, so a lot of our technology, our servers, email, uh, our phone system needed to be upgraded and we were going to spend money on that in the next year or two. Uh, so we'll be able to use some CARES Act money to cover those expenses. Uh, we still will have additional CARES money available. Uh, one, if it's available to be used to offset revenue or if we have additional expenses that come up over the next uh, five months. In depth with regards to using those funds that's available to the school? Uh, it is. They also they got, they got some directly um, and they, we have met often with, uh, with Onique to make sure that their needs are being met. Um, but yes, like school transportation, if school comes back uh, full time or even part time and we need extra buses, that's one way we can easily pay for that. So they kind of covered the next one. Number C, on August 12th, we held a tax foreclosure auction and we brought in almost $570,000. That was an insane amount of money, easily double what I thought we were gonna bring in. Um, and these were a lot of problem nuisance properties as well. So it's great to one, get them back on tax rolls and two, hopefully a new owner can flip them and turn them into something that uh, improves the neighborhood. Uh, economic development, uh, you may have noticed the sidewalks on East Main were completed. Uh, we have planters that we ordered from the state corrections facility. Uh, they built them at a much cheaper cost. The only problem is currently they're not making them. <laughs> so uh, when they are back in making things, uh, they'll be delivered and hopefully everything will be lined up that we can use them and plant them in the spring. In the spring. Uh, we are applying for the additional funds to do from Walgreens to Cody Ave. Um, and that would uh, complete the entire length of East Main sidewalks on both sides. And 
and I, that follows down through South Main and uh, here downtown. What they've done looks great. So far. Looks good. And one of the great things um, across the street, Honeydew, uh, they let us take a little bit of their parking lot so we can add some landscaping, kind of beautify that a little bit. Some of the other neighbors weren't so excited about that, but hopefully they see that and like, hey, that looks great. Maybe we can do that in the future. Uh, so over here on High Street, if you remember at the June town meeting, we approved the acceptance of a donation of uh, four parcels there. We are gonna be developing kind of a mini dog park just to kind of clean up the area back there. Uh, so you may see the brush being removed over the next few weeks. Another thing that we're exploring is a lot of towns, they have, uh, they get the money from a charter or their cable company, and they use that to have a studio somewhere. And uh, we thought we might kill two birds with one stone, have a studio, but also uh, fill a vacant storefront somewhere in the downtown area. Kind of, our hope is to pick one of the worst ones and <laughs> improve it and make it a good, uh, studio space. I was just involved in doing a video with the mayor in Worcester for another volunteer job and they have one on Main Street and with the green screen. Yep. And, yeah, it's a great idea. Now who would be eligible to? So uh, yeah any resident would be able to come in and use it. Uh, we'd have to make hours so that um, they're there when it's staffed uh, but yeah we would have a little uh, place with a green screen or drop downs or even some tables and chairs for a interview setting. So you mean for fans and members for those? Yep, definitely could be. Yeah, I think that the, the key thing there is that you have someone there to operate the equipment. Yeah, yeah. Which, uh, yeah, Carol, that would fall under Carol under her, her current communications responsibilities, uh, but it certainly wouldn't be staffed full time there. Uh, and then it's nice to see I have had three different parties express some interest in storefronts in our downtown uh, over the past couple of weeks. Um, we actually had quite a bit of interest pre-pandemic and then everything fell apart. Um, but that people are asking and it's great news. Um, and uh, You never know if any of these will pan out, but I, I have a feeling that one or two of them will. I, I would um, comment and congratulate uh, Pastor Janice Ford uh, the opening word with recovery center was, was something that we as well. Yep. Um, I should have put that on there, but they have an open house late September, I think maybe the 23rd. And, uh, I'll make sure that you all get an invitation too. Uh, moving on to the infrastructure items. Uh, so Lake Parkway, Claybird Avenue, uh, ongoing. Uh, soon we'll actually see real work, <laughs> real, uh, the ground being moved. Uh, Memorial Beach, last uh, meeting, uh, they were approved by conservation, so we'll be bidding that out. Um, if you've seen behind the Opry building on Main Street, the parking lot back there is looking great. Uh, the binder coat's down, so uh, a little bit more work to do with the islands, and then the top coat can go in in the next week or two. Uh, National Grid, you've probably all seen the, a lot of work being done on South Main, so they're replacing the gas lines there, but they will be repaving all of that. Uh, so we'll have a newish uh, Main Street all the way from the Rose Room to the town line. And let's see, oh, the gazebo uh, got a new roof uh, a couple weeks ago. Looks great. Uh, it was Supposed to, supposed to be a relatively easy cheap project and then they ripped everything off and everything is rotten underneath it. So <laughs> it doubled the price. Uh, and then uh, this building, uh, we are working to get the roof repairs uh, that will need a vote at town meeting in October. Uh, but hopefully we can make that happen. Under, we have kind of revitalized our nuisance properties and economic development task forces, the, the in-house department head meetings. Um, a little bit, they fell off the bandwagon during the pandemic, but over the last month or so, we brought them back and uh, it's good. We're all ready to get back at it and uh, make sure we get things going. Uh, the library opened earlier this month. 
it has been fairly steady, not uh, overly crowded. Um, I'm actually very happy with it. They're happy as well. Um, I think it was actually really difficult for them to do curbside pickups. So being able to have people come in and browse is uh, working out very good. Can I ask a question about the library? Yeah. Um, residents had asked me this question. I think there's a requirement, um, if this is correct, that if you're in one of the rooms alone, one of the, the study type rooms or you know, those closed in rooms, that you actually have to still keep your mask on when you're alone in that room, is that true? Uh, I don't think that's true because we were not allowing the study rooms to be used yet. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so that, that's one thing we have, we'll look at in the future. Um, yeah, I, I, we want to somewhat limit what need to be cleaned all the time, um, but that is something we can look at in the future. Uh, there are a, a lot of libraries have not reopened, so I think we are getting um, some overflow from our surrounding communities that they have not reopened their libraries. So it's been a little busy, but not too bad. Um, yeah, the other two items, yeah, the senior center employees have been great helping out with the early voting, so they're the ones staffing it right now. Uh, and then the minutes, uh, I've tasked Courtney with making sure everyone gets those up there, so uh, she's going to be the pit bull. A couple of other things. Uh, the board was got this email, but uh, the lawsuit, Hilton versus Ralph, uh, was dismissed by the court, so you know, we always hear the count out so many lawsuits against it, but um, obviously some of them are completely <laughs> Illegitimate or uh, or will be dismissed. Uh, Doug, that brings up a point. Maybe Courtney can take a look at this. We may we would have to probably release for public any of the discussions in our executive sessions. Yeah, that, on I, that. that is a good point. Uh, and then uh, Randy mentioned earlier that the uh, the open meeting law violation that we tried to cure at our last meeting was accepted um, by both the. Plankton and the Attorney General's office. Any other questions for Doug? Doug, okay, I just have a question. You had uh, reported on the uh, school committee uh, that there'll be 100% involved, and um, that includes the, the special needs and, and everyone. Uh, I believe initially, yes. Uh, let me confirm that. So I think the first two weeks are everyone's remote. Um, I don't want to speak for them, but I think there is a feeling that uh, by the time schools reopen that a lot of them will be moving to full remote as yeah. well. They're, they're actually front loading all of the professional development. So normally during the year, what they would do is they would take half of the lenses for professional development. Um, what they're doing is front loading all the professional development for the beginning of the year. And they're starting off that first two week period to prep the teachers for the remote learning. And it won't, it's anticipated to be a hybrid model. Um, and they'll all, unlike during the spring, they did the teaching from their homes. They'll actually be in school doing their remote teaching. So they're going to get acclimated to the technology, to the methods, what the expectations are. So those first two weeks for them, um, well, actually, I should. First two weeks before it actually starts, that's what's happening. And then it'll go into remote and then transition into the, hopefully, into the hybrid. Yeah. And, and we'll see how that turns out with the, the hybrid. The only uh, points that I can write down um, Memorial Beach, just another thank you to Carol. I know she was at a recent meeting, but they've done a great job because they've probably experienced more visitors there this year than ever, given the conditions that were in the heat and of course, COVID. So thank you to Carol and her crew because uh, we won't see them before they all disperse um, for our next meeting. And also, you know, just a note for Jen Sullivan and her team, we're not declaring victory, but um, to be a one um, is a great place to be. Let's hope it stays there. And a lot of that is due to their hard work, so. Kudos to them as well. Um, no other questions for Doug? I've seen a motion to accept Doug's report. Motion to accept the town administrator's report. Second. Okay. Motion and a second. Any further discussion? Courtney, would you pull the board, please? Motion, Flavor. 
Yes. 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 And next item on the agenda is uh, I'll entertain a uh, motion to enter executive session uh, under number three to discuss strategy with respect to collective bargaining or litigation. If an open meeting may have a detrimental effect on the bargaining or litigating position of the public body, and the chair so declares, this is to approve the executive session minutes of August 3rd. We will come back into session simply to uh, close out the meeting. So moved. Any further questions? Courtney, would you pull the board, please? Yes. 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 So we are in executive session. Doug, um, how are we handling the recording? Can we make sure we're done? Thank you. 